All right. So I think we are live. There's always, always a brief delay between the loading screen. But hey, everybody, how's everyone doing on Facebook today? Uh, it's been a couple weeks since we've done one of these. And uh, a lot has been happening. There's been other live streams going on. So uh, I wanted to start off with a couple announcements today, actually. So um, I, like I've been doing, these are these are live stream events that typically get uh, syndicated on uh, the Mutations uh, podcast and then sometimes on my YouTube channel. So if you are interested in picking this up later or hearing it via audio, that will also be available for you. Um, so the biggest announcement actually is uh, you will see in the show notes that Everpresent Origin, uh, Gene Gepser's main book translated into English is now available on the Kindle. And it is an ebook. It's a bit of a pricey ebook, around thirty, thirty-two dollars. But um, it's it's a fantastic boon for anybody who's been researching this and who would like to finally add their annotations and have them organized in one place. Uh, I know for me, this is going to be a, a process of porting over. Um, some of you can see this here in the video. I'm holding up the book. Uh, porting over my copious notes and uh, earmarks and tags and bookmarks, et cetera, uh, all over Everpresent Origin into, um, into the ebook version. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And you can find the link in the show notes on the right or wherever you see this. Um, so yeah, that's fantastic. And I think we've been waiting a long time for that to, to happen. Um, now, in terms of other books, other translations, I know there's a number of them in the works. Um, so I'm hoping that with this Kindle translation and that uh, this Kindle edition and then uh, future editions and translations, there'll be a lot more Gepser related material and Gepser translations available in English, finally. Um, so very much looking forward to that and definitely check that out in the notes to pick up if you uh, can afford it. Um, so what else? I, I named this uh, mutations, temps, pandemic, uh, mainly because I wanted to talk about time and climate and the kind of biological, civilizational uh, entanglement that we seem to be falling with, falling into, like a singularity these days. Um, but before I get to that, uh, maybe a couple updates as well on the the book writing process. So I'm in the middle of copious outlining, uh, writing fragments and rewriting them and revisioning them, talking with my wife all the time, talking her ear off about um, some of the theories and the ideas that are in the book, but uh, it's called Fragments of an Integral Futurism. It's not yet available for pre-sale or anything like that, but I'm hoping that will be, uh, will be the case a little bit later this fall. And what I'm really hoping to do with this book, similar to the topic of, uh, of this live stream, is to bring together both a revised picture of cultural evolution um, in a much more nonlinear and dynamic and um, uh, uh, how we say like nonlinear and complex sort of way uh, on the one hand. So kind of as William Irwin Thompson might say, recode history and flip that as well to a kind of a new sense, and this is sort of Gepser's thesis and something I'm, on for, I'm very much on board with, uh, flip this temporal sense uh, into the present as a kind of praxis, an orientation, a phenomenology, a way to be in the world in the present, and therefore a way to um, um, embody in the most generative and integral sense what the future could be, right? What emergence could be, what becoming could be. So it's very much tempor, it orbits around temporics and it uh, is attempting to present us with both a more complex living dynamic map of history and cultural evolution. And then on the other hand, um, uh, a way to cohere in the present for the future. Um, so it's a much, it's a very imminental book. Um, and it's very much inspired by, I'll just, you know, name a few different influences. Obviously, Jean Gepser is a big one. Um, I'm very much uh, interested in the research by David uh, Wengro and David Graeber 
on the Upper Paleolithic and the history of human societies in the Upper Paleolithic and how a lot of our, our, our textbook histories of these times need to be rewritten. They're much more dynamic and complex than our, our linear narratives in terms of growth and progress and the evolution of complexity, the hierarchical organization of societies. All of those things need to be seen in a much more dynamic way. And our maps and our histories need to express that dynamism in a way that is both elegant and communicative of that form of thinking, right? Our maps have to finally be living. Our maps have to be more, and this is, I wrote this in my notes this morning. Our maps have to be more like slime molds or um, rhizomatic mycelial networks in that they must be dynamic and living and generative for that style of thinking and being in the world and doing, of course. So this is what the book's about. It sounds like quite a lot, but the theme is how do we better understand where we have come from, where we are going, temporics, and of course, pathways and tools of thinking to cohere um, uh, an emergent, more planetary future. So very excited to get that to you. It's called Fragments of an Integral Futurism. And I am, as I said, uh, in the midst of, of deep diving about it and, uh, and, and writing about it. But these, these live streams kind of help uh, flesh out some of these ideas. Um, I've been recommending this to everybody. Speaking of, uh, this is one of the books that I have been doing for my research, but it's called, uh, let's see, I get that on the screen there for you. If you're not watching this, then it's called Against the Grain by James C. Scott, A Deep History of the Early Estates, like Wengro and Graeber. Uh, Scott is really interested in um, uh, throwing a wrench in, in the chains of uh, certain myths that we have about the early states and agriculture, particularly really looking at the early states of Mesopotamia and how for about 4,000 years, we had proto-urban environments with all of the different uh, <laughs> symbiotic modules for agriculture, right? We had domestication of animals, we had domestication of plants, domestication of people, and yet there was no coercive central organizing state. Rather, there was um, a much more dynamic and fluid experimentation with social systems that would oscillate depending on the season, depending on the availability of environmental resources, um, uh, a, a settled uh, community, and then moving into more nomadic communities and using a diverse array of resources to, to provide subsistence. Um, so like Scott, uh, Wengro and Graeber are talking about this too, but even going back further, to the Upper Paleolithic period. And I know some of you have already heard me ramble about this, but I find this to be really interesting, especially if we are interested in the history of consciousness and models of cultural evolution, we really need to be integrating some of the latest data and research that is frankly quite paradigm changing and much more in line with uh, a kind of non-linear non dynamic and um, simultaneous orientation, the kind of integral orientation we're talking about. We should read history integrally because I believe the more we do that, um, the more it is compatible with the emerging sciences, the more the emerging social sciences, archeology, span et cetera. And it makes integral pedagogy and integral scholarship far more on par and ready to engage with some of the latest research and contemporary thought rather than railing against it, right? Um, I think developmental thinking and uh, stage structure models of consciousness have had a hard time butting up against more mainstream discussions about, while well, there is no order or telos of things, et cetera. I think we can find a way through that and in a certain sense, um, provide certain dynamic working models of emergence without necessarily needing some of the tools that uh, previous theorists of cultural evolution have had to yield to. Uh, such as uh, meta abstract thinking, uh, a, a more strictly developmental logic that sort of supersedes historical processes and organizes them according to a map. Um, let, let us let our maps become alive. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, our maps should be more like slime molds and more like rhizomes or more like the topographies of moss. I'm thinking of uh, Jeff Vandermeer's work, uh, Annihilation. 
uh, where it, it, there's a certain surrealist scene where uh, the letters, uh, there's, a, there's a sentence growing <laughs> in, uh, in this interesting little tower, uh, but I'll leave the spoilers for, for those of you who wanna go read the book. So can our ideas be alive, right? Can our ideas be much more dynamic in that Deleuzian sense of um, uh, really kind of hooked into the, the pathway to the witch's flight? Uh, can thinking be merged with, as Gepser would say, cystasis, which is um, a transparency to living systems, and I don't even want to say systems, to life, to the mutual dynamic interactions of, of, of living symbiotic systems, right? Can our maps begin to look like that, and can we develop those in a way that is elegant and useful as a toolkit for, for um, researchers? And so... That being said, uh, that's sort of what I'm in the in the wading through right now in terms of my research. I'm also looking at uh, this is a fantastic book as well, a little little text called Enlivenment um, by Andreas Weber towards a poetic toward a poetics for the Anthropocene, which is also a fantastic read. It's very short. It's a little manifesto. Um, so, and I want to also mention since this is a live stream. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the recording, where I stream these to Facebook usually, I might try Twitter next. But if anyone does want to chime in with some commentary or reflections, um, feel free to. Typically, that's how these things go. Um, there's a lot of interesting commentary coming from my network. So uh, I like the, again, the mutuality of these sort of streams and the, and the uh, quasi immediate engagement with uh, many of my very intelligent friends. So feel free to dive in or, or jump in there. Um, and for those of you who are joining me, just a quick reminder, uh, what I said at the outset, Ever Present Origin is available on Kindle, finally, and you can get that today. Um, so I'm gonna be, this has been immensely helpful for me to categorize and, and, and map out and access very easily um, uh, a lot of my notes. So feel free to go check that out. Uh, what else, what else? Besides Wangro um, and Graeber and Scott and Weber, um, I've been thinking about specifically with the book, um, the need for, and this is, this is the sort of the other piece, and I won't go into it too much, but there are certain models and maps that while they could be interpreted in a static way, could be much more enlivened, speaking of, uh, by introducing process-oriented thinking, by um, encouraging interchangeability of different domains and simultaneity in, in so that they kind of fold in upon one another and the map is used as a kind of praxis to almost like training wheels for integral thinking or integrative thinking so that we are constantly dynamically relating one domain of ourselves to another domain of ourselves uh, without kind of freezing those domains, right? We don't just want to visualize the map and see the whole in a sort of static way. The whole only really emerges when we're introducing temporics, which means the whole only emerges when there's multiple ways of relating and multiple processes that are taking place simultaneously, right? So I know Wilbur has that phrase, tetra ar arising. Um, for Gebser, he has two very interesting phrases, and I think I mentioned one already. It's cystasis and synairesis. And I don't want to get into this too deeply, but essentially cystasis is the capacity for our modes of thinking to accommodate time, to accommodate life, right? To accommodate aliveness in our thinking or so that thinking becomes transparent to aliveness. Now, Weber's work would be a good example of that. Gregory Bateson's would be a good example. Nora Bateson, Bateson's work, which uh, she introduced this concept of sympathesis which he's replacing uh, from a holonic theory and sort of a systems theory. A sympathesis is, is, is not a whole and a part. It's a whole part. It's a mutual learning. It's a mutual learning and becoming. It's a matter meaning. Uh, and when we introduce this, we're introducing what Gebser called the cystasis, the cystasis which is um, not just process-oriented thinking, but really fine-tuning a perceptive sensi sensitivity to temporics on temporics own terms, right? Time has its own qualitative, characteristic, subjective-oriented 
form of expression and thinking and poetics that we really need to um, uh, uh, leave room for in, in our thinking, especially as, as integralists. Because I think, the, the, as Bateson says, there's some criticism with having a purely systems theory oriented approach, which um, removes some of the, the component of aliveness in, in biology and living systems. So I'm very interested in this book in presenting a few adapted models of how we can allow our thinking to become more symathesi-like, more cystasis-like, more dynamic and integral. And I think once we do that, some of the problems with, um, with uh, let's say, uh, static-oriented thinking or categorical or developmental thinking will seem, you know, we don't even need to oppose that style of thinking. There's just a much more dynamic way of presenting it that does the job so much better. And so it sort of just lets that be, you know? And I think I've personally come along uh, uh, around to that myself in, in, in uh, engaging in debates and is, is Gepser more uh, integral than, than Wilbur? It's very silly to even phrase it that way, but cystasis and temporics are just so necessary. And once we, all we need to do is creatively engage with it on its own terms and the results will reveal themselves. And the second terminology that I introduced here was synairesis. A synairesis for Gebser is an even more difficult term to introduce, but essentially it's um, applied cystasis. It is emergent generative practice of mattering with meaning, subjectivity, and becoming, right? It is uh, the perspectival world, as Gebser would say, spatializing and static thinking or mechanical thinking rendered transparent to the multiplicity and complexity and nonlinearity of temporics. And what emerges from that could be uh, what we would say a, a integrals, plural, right? Expressions of the integral world. This could be art, this could be science, um, and that very often are both. And actually, this is the final piece that I'm just going to hint at here in terms of the, some of the chapter writing. But uh, I do believe some of Neri Oxman's work is is very much uh, along these lines of expression in terms of allowing the arts and the sciences to be seen as entangled. She has a fantastic essay I recommend called The Age of Entanglement, which I'm also drawing from uh, in my book. So that's sort of like the cutting edge stuff, right? The, the, the stuff that I'm very interested in um, uh, contributing to, to integral scholarship. So definitely check all those out. But does anyone have any comments or questions about all this or, or even taking topics from, from uh, participants, anybody who's on Facebook, if you have any lingering haunting questions or commentary or, or uh, side reel directions for this live stream, feel free to jump in the chat and uh, share your thoughts. Um, so maybe what I can do as well is uh, introduce this book. This is uh, Ryan Nakade introduced it to me called The Scent of Time. And as a kind of final piece for the book, uh, for this live stream at least, it's, uh, it's by Byung Chul Han, a Korean German philosopher. And I've begun to read it, begun to dig into it this week. And I think this, well, first of all, it's about time and temporics, which I'm very interested in. It's sort of the, the, the central orbit of my, uh, my own studies, but uh, Han seems to be, as far as I, as far as I'm aware of, so in reading this, um, making a case for slowing down. And this is something Ryan Nakade and I were, were talking about yesterday, uh, in terms of the emergent, coherent themes of the Anthropocene, of the integral world. Um, we have a lot of phraseologies, right? We have a lot of terms and descriptions from different writers, and I think there's a sort of overlay or uh, cohering in which all of these different thinkers are poetically linked with one another. So Han is talking about kind of the, the, the slowing down of time and suspension, uh, suspension of time as a kind of counteractive to uh, the drivenness of, of our, uh, both our economic system and therefore our culture, right? This driving forward of history, of the industry. This is not the same thing. And I think this is something that uh, we, we tend to do when we naturalize 
uh, capitalism as an economic system uh, is to say, well, it generates creativity. It's this great engine of novelty, et cetera. I would make a profound distinction between uh, the capacity to become present and allow in mutuality emergence to take place, which is a creative process as well as a spiritual one. It's something that all living systems and living entities do with the world, a kind of a poetics of, of, of biology, I might call it, and I'm borrowing some phrases from Andreas Weber's work. Um, that is not the same thing as um, a, an engine without brakes, right? An engine that is constantly speeding up. Sure, there might be novelty generated from this, but novelty in the sense of catastrophe, right? It, it, it drives things to collapse. And in that sense, it, it is a kind of a death drive, right? In terms of our economic system, what so many people are talking about today from Jim Bendel to Joe Brewer, many climate scientists. Um, so I think we really have to make some very careful distinctions between um, naturalizing capitalism and the sense of which emergence and innovation and creativity can arise when we become more present, when life is present in a mutual, mutual learning process with itself and with other. Um, this is very, you know, I think this is sort of a foundational style of thinking for, for a creative cosmology. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the folks at CIS talk about this quite a bit as well, uh, cosmotheandric principles and, uh, and so on. But um, what I want to get to with this is the cohering themes of slowing down. Uh, Han makes this point. Um, you know, even Weber in his, in his cosmological argument to become present in the mutualness of becoming and creativity of life, it requires a sort of imminence to settle into our awareness. Gepser himself would always talk about concretization and the process of concretization as a becoming present to the originary presence in the present, right? To allow the present to come forward in our awareness, which is a creative and originary act. Um, and, and, and a function of life, a function of life and death, right? It's, it's all imminent and present. Uh, then, of course, we have other thinkers um, that I, I, could, I could list a couple of them, but uh, we have uh, Bio Akomalafe, uh, who I've really come to appreciate his work recently, but he has this concept of a slow urgency, right? Um, and I'll just read to you some of the opening lines from this great little piece he, he uh, published. A slower urgency, we will dance with the mountains. And he says, I learned a long time ago about a particular saying from the continent I grew up on. The times are urgent, let us slow down. Uh, and so I, I think there is something to this that the, the and this is why we named uh, one of the podcasts I, I collaborate with called Growing Down, borrowing that from James Hillman. Um, but that's why we named it that, that there seems to be a turn these, these days, and especially during this year, during the pandemic of slowing down, uh, becoming more imminent, um, or the failure to do so, right? Um, I think at the beginning of this pandemic, there was a real sense of coherence and clarity about the need for mutual aid practices, the need to rethink the kind of backbone distribution systems and economic ideologies that we hold uh, uh, as kind of idols in the present because they're not life centric, they're not human centric. And we've dealt with the fallout of that style of thinking and practice, um, obviously in, the, in the, the way that this pandemic has unfolded. So there is that, I mean, even the crisis itself, right? This is something I've spoken about in, in previous episodes. The crisis itself functions as a kind of teacher. There's a kind of um, uh, pedagogy of catastrophe uh, that Michelle uh, Bowens writes about. So we orbit around these themes of growing down, becoming present, uh, becoming more life-centric, uh, more human-centric. And I don't mean that in a humanist way because I think to become more human-centric the human has to be distributed and decentered in the post-human turn, which is a terminology from uh, uh, academia that I'm very interested in. And uh, Bio himself is, uh, I think, considers himself a post-humanist. 
um, and are very interested in uh, doing some academic work between Gepster studies and posthumanism. That's just a side note. So there's a coming down to earth, as Bruno Latour talks about, a imminent of an imminental turn, a concretization turn, a slowing down. Um, another another fantastic writer about this is Ursula K. Le Guin, and I've mentioned her essay before too. But I find it's interesting that you know, as I study this and I work on my book. There is this deeper sense of coherence um, uh, in a very internationalist sense, right? And and thankfully very diverse in that, um, you know, with Le Guin, what she talks about in her essay, uh, California as a non-Euclidean uh, or very cold place to be, something along those lines. And her whole thing is, you know, we're not going to get to utopia by marching forward anymore. Reversals might be in order. Slowing down might be in order. Um, becoming more present and aware might be in order. Um, side reel turns might indeed be in order. So whatever is occurring, it is a move out of the back and forth of, of uh, going forward and uh, or retreating back, right? As, as, as reactionaries and regressives um, might, might find very appealing. Um, and the trajectory, and this is Latour speaking, when he has this discussion of, uh, uh, the, the trajectory of globalization as a process, right? This has been the, the telos of our, of our Western culture, uh, the birth of the humanities and then the eruption of modernity and colonization and, uh, and so on. Uh, that process is winding down anyway. Um, it may seem like it's speeding up. There, it may seem like there's acceleration occurring. And that's mostly because the, the, the motions we've set in place with our, our economic social system um, are ex manu, as Gepser would say. They're out of the hands. They've, they're out of control. They're a machine that is no longer flying, but it is certainly um, hurling through the air, and there are no brakes. And some of the, the, the crisis here is both coming back down to earth in that scary sense of this thing isn't operating anymore like we had hopes we can't pedal faster because it doesn't do anything regardless. We're, we're still coming back down to earth. So the side reel turn is really this imminent turn uh, towards a deeper coherence, less abstraction, more embodiment, um, and, a, and a deeper sense of the multiplicity of becoming present in temporix. And that's one of the reasons why I threw in uh, temps in here. Uh, there's a great little book uh, called, I think I have here. I always have it floating around. I guess I don't have it here. Um, well, there's a great book called uh, The Progress of This Storm by, um, I think his name is Andreas Malm. And what he talks about towards the beginning of his book, and I think I've mentioned this on uh, potentially a live stream before, uh, but what he talks about in his book is the, the origins of the word temps. And he borrows this from a Walter Benjamin uh, journal entry just a, a little note, a little fragment to Benjamin talking to himself about the origin of the word temps. And it means both weather and time. And it harkens back to, uh, speaking of you know, cultural evolution, a time in which time and weather were connected. The time on the calendar, the Gregorian calendar, uh, as we use it today is far more abstracted than let's say an agrarian lifestyle that is much more connected to the earth and the patterns of the seasons. Um, and so time meant weather, meant climate. And in many ways, we're seeing a kind of resurgence of that. And what I like about Malm, even though he's kind of um, uh, orthodox in the one sense, and this is my critique of his book, if you do read it, um, he's orthodox in one sense in that he is uh, essentially highly critical of the ontological term that many humanities professors and researchers are, are proclaiming the, the end of nature. And he kind of straw mans this a little bit. Uh, you know, needless to say, there are probably people who do feel a kind of triumphing over nature and that we must now um, mass manage in an industrial sense climate because of the climate catastrophe and bring CO2 levels down and um, in a sense terraform the earth uh, because of our, our problems. He's very critical of that. Um, but I, I, I don't think he gets the deeper ontological turn that's taking place here. Uh, that 
human beings and nature, civilization and the natural world are so entangled and always have been with one another that ontologically speaking, it makes no sense to produce and create culture without that as the baseline understanding, right? Everything we do now is like Neri Oxman says, mothering nature and nature, uh, mothering nature and, uh, and not, well, there's two phrases, right? We have mother nature and then the flip of this is mothering nature. And, but we keep flipping it. And I think that's the idea. There's a simultaneity and a mutuality here. The critique only works, the Malm's critique only really works against uh, the Anthropocene scholars if there's no mutuality. But this is the secret. This is the ontological key, I think, for the Anthropocene, that we are mutually in a creative sympoietic process with the natural world, with biology and the sciences, with planetary dynamics. That veil has been lifted. There's transparency there. And with that transparency, which is irrevocable, right, we will either learn to work with that new world in mutuality with the planet, or we will die by that mutuality, right? The crisis will, as Gebser says, outlive us or we will outlive it. But part of this has to do with overcoming that anthropocentric turn. So in that sense, I really like Malm because he's critiquing that anthropocentrism of a lot of these um, sort of planetary engineer thinkers. Um, and I, I think he is making a case that nature is, is, if anything, triumphing over everything human beings have been doing. It is resurging in such a powerful way through, again, through temps, through climate through time. And what's interesting about Mom too is that he kind of comes to a Gebserian thesis with this, that temporix becomes important in the Anthropocene in that um, what we deal with now is a sense of um, temporal entanglement in any given moment that the fossil fuels that we continue to produce are affecting hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of different species um, the, the complex dynamical relations of weather and human beings in the future, our descendants, right? Our living descendants, it affects them. But it also, in this temporal entanglement uh, metaphor, it also deeply, we're being deeply affected by the past in the sense that the, the chimney smoke and the coal mining and the steam engines from the 18 and 1700s, in a certain sense, are still wrapped up in the effects of climate, the climate crisis right now and showing up as dynamic um, extreme weather patterns, et cetera. And I say this as Florida has just kind of been grazed by um, a, a hurricane and hurricane season has started once again. So there's a temporal entanglement, which is kind of the, the baseline mode, mo mode of, of ontology that we have to deal with. There's a temporal entanglement of uh, human beings, human culture making, and the natural, quote unquote, natural world. So what I'm very interested in are scholars that, as Gebser was talking about in 1949, in a very kind of prescient way, uh, scholars who are trying to work from that understanding from the get-go, right, to develop epistemology, um, designing processes, uh, coherence processes with culture to help us begin to inhabit that world much more consciously and in mutuality with the rest of the planet, with the non-human world. I mean, what else can we do right now? I mean, this is the, one of the most urgent things we can focus on. And yet it's that kind of slow urgency that Bio speaks of. Uh, it is that becoming present that Gebser speaks of. It's that um, going back to look forward that Le Guin speaks of. Um, for Han, there's this kind of, you know, we, we need to release the speeding ahead because when we do that, we have a much better sense of how to navigate this crisis and our action becomes uh, like, like an acupuncture point, uh, much more to the point, right? Much more effective and efficient with the ontology of the present, right? With the world and the reality of the present. The more we speed ahead, the less efficient our solutions become. We become like the spinning of wheels, um, the motoricity of, 
of uh, you know, late capitalism itself, the engine of its own undoing itself. We don't want to be like that. So what we have to do is become more present. And I would just add, just as like a note here, um, in terms of like what 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 is the umbrella term we can say well this is my interpretation of what uh, many scholars are calling uh, regenerative culture uh, in in theory and practice whether we're talking about um, uh, decentering distribution and food production localizing economies and commu and and relocalizing communities uh, in a kind of cosmopolitan sense connected through the internet. Um, this is the kind of cohering world we're entering into. And I don't want to say it's a utopia uh, because obviously it's wrapped up in a crisis and a catastrophe. And in many senses, it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, how would you say it? It's, it's kind of a, a result of the crisis. We're not doing this as an enlightened society. It's almost as if the, the planetary dynamics are kind of giving us a hard lesson. Right. And they were really kind of showing us that, OK, regenerative, coherent, slowing down. Right. These are the messages if we would to give if we were to give agency to this process, this planetary dynamic that we're receiving, we can listen to that. We we we, we can't. Um, unfortunately, it seems like we still haven't really cohered about our response as a species. Um, but if there's any positive indication, I'll end here and then we'll jump to the comments. Let's see, we have a few. If there's any positive indication in this year that um, there has been a more constructive and regenerative turn. I think it has been um, how much so many of these ideas have come from, have moved from the periphery into a more mainstream discussion. Um, and unfortunately, this is where I, um, I I try to be as realistic as pro as possible with like, you know, the material sense of things and where our nation states are at and where, you know, our, our civilization is at. Um, you know, the the response has this just not been quick enough, in that sense. On the one hand, and we haven't been present enough with some of these solutions, which we could achieve, as we see this year with the pandemic, quite, quote unquote, rapidly, right? In terms of slowing down would be one of the 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 most helpful things we could do economically ecologically etc so you know i don't know if that's really a lesson learned but the more this crisis intensifies in this century um, and the more the bottom falls out of this old world and its old ontology um i at least have some like joanna macy you might say active active hope um in human beings and our capacity to undergo mutation, a mutation of consciousness, transformation of culture. We've seen it occur over the centuries. Um, this is one of the big ones. This is one of the really difficult ones. Um, I have a trust, as Gepser would say, a primal trust uh, that we will respond at least in part um, and that might be sufficient enough, you know, uh, for us to, to outlive this crisis. Um, and again, as it intensifies, I do think more, more release of the old ontology will begin to take hold and cohere in our social imagining so that it becomes a planetary imagining. Um, a lot of innovation needs to take place. And then as a final, final note, that's where I think we really need to, and there's enough of us now who are talking about this, we really need to be in collaboration with different projects that are trying to engineer, create design solutions. They already have this new ontology. They already are kind of embodying this. Um, so these, these communities have to be both pedagogical and also highly innovative and transformative so that they can be applied um, uh, and in both kind of creative design, architectural, engineering, community building, et cetera, right? Economic, social, retrieving the commons, regenerative uh, localization practices. These are all kind of design implement implementation sciences of this new ontology that I think um, we need to build the, the, the mutual network, a network of mutual learning for uh, in this time. So if anything, you know, slowing down and taking a, a look of you know, what everyone is doing will enable us to kind of become 
uh, acutely aware of uh, who to begin speaking with and who to begin sharing with. So I hope this happens. I see it happening. Um, we'll, we'll see, you know, I, um, I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist about this. So, but anyway, that's the end of this rant. Let me jump over to our comments and questions and see if we've got anything going here. Yeah, let's 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 check out some good comments here. Um, <laughs> Steve is saying post singularity, post scarcity, the end of time. Yeah, there's um, there's there's well, I'll I'll just I don't know if we're referring to uh, Hans' work here. Um, as he says in the preface, the very opening lines, which sold, sold the book for me um, in The Scent of Time. He says, today's temporal crisis is not a crisis of acceleration. The age of acceleration is already over. What we experience today is, as acceleration is only one of the symptoms of temporal dispersal. Um, then he goes on, but uh, just the idea that the engine has stopped running we're just kind of hurtling through the air now right um very very fast so um gepser says something similar that the extension of um modernity's directive temporix uh that mode of history and history is this kind of sense of you know time moving forward and backward uh Ontologically, that's over. The world no longer supports it. And you can even think of it like that. The world underneath us, ontologically speaking, as the ground, has already is already an integral world. It always has been. But the acuteness of that lesson, that realization, is now beneath our feet. And everything's crumbling and falling apart because we're already in this emergent ontology, this emergent integral reality. And um, and it sounds kind of metaphysical, but I mean this in a profoundly perceptual ontological sense of this is the temporix planetary dynamics. We're living in it. You know, we need to learn this. It's just we're going to be broken by it if we don't in, in the most existential sense, um, in the most material sense. Right. So the end of time, the end of time is not Francis Fukuyama. The end of time is not. Uh, neoliberal capitalism is the capstone of Western history. Or if it is, if it is, the world is bigger than that. Time is more than that. Time is more multiplicitous than that. And the annunciation of the end of history, as Fukuyama and, and, and so on had, had, had proclaimed at the end of the 20th century, um, they didn't realize what they were really saying was, now we enter the death process of time. And the implications of that are, of course, um, much more concerning, right? Um, so, yes. Yeah, Robin says, never-ending growth in monocapitalism is the operating system for the Death Star. Yeah, that's the OS, right? That's the OS they've installed, planet destruction. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that the, the whole idea really behind uh, so many of the different models I've been looking at and, uh, and, and paradigm theorists I've been looking at are saying that what we really need is a polyphony of different modalities of expression. And this echoes directly with what Gepser says or what Marshall McLuhan says, or what, um, again, the, the, this ontology of the a perspectival world is simultaneity is key here, right? We have a multiplicity of modes of being in the world, temporally and spatially. Time is cyclical and directive. It's imminent. It's uh, time is a network of relationality in a sort of a perspectival sense. Time is a pointedness uh, uh, of the infinite now, right? And time is timelessness. Um, so the, the 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 multiplicity of our different modes of consciousness, the multiplicity of our different modes of being in the world as human societies, all of that um, has to be able to come forward. And I think that's part of the crisis. We've developed a monoculture, which is a culture, you know, anything that is monological is, is a death drive because it becomes static, atomized, isolated, then ultimately undoes itself. So uh, this is also kind of one of the themes that, uh, that crops up in, um, again, my book and in David Wengro and David Graeber's work and James Scott's work with prehistory, quote unquote, 
um, and the, the early history of the state and the upper Paleolithic history, that human beings um, lived a much more dynamic way. The question isn't so much uh, why did civilization arise to begin with, it is how can we achieve the plurality of, of, our, uh, of our multiplicity? How can we realize that both socially and, and civilizationally? And, and part of this is to give up civilization in the sense of um, the agricultural urbanized environment with monocrops um, doesn't work well. It never has, as Joe Brewer says, the states have always collapsed because they don't really work with their bioregional capacities. Um, and then moving into the structures of consciousness, we are the archaic, the magic, the mythic, the mental. Uh, we are a multiplicity of, of, of different expressions of consciousness. Um, and human beings have lived in a multiplicity of ways on planet Earth. So part of this integral turn is a release from that monodirectorial, monocrop uh, hegemony of the mental structure of consciousness or the perspective of the world. You know, there's nothing evil about the mental structure. There's nothing evil about the perspective of the world. It allows individuation. It allows um, uh, a deeper sense of material history. It opens that possibility up. And for that, it is simply a part of who we are. Uh, but the difficulty is privileging it in exclusivity and denying the ecology of consciousness that we actually are. So even when it comes to history of consciousness, cultural evolution, our own subjectivity as human beings, right? Um, we are more than we allow our, our, our culture to, to let us express. And this is not uh, a, a cliche or an anecdotal statement. It is an existential crisis that we've writ large into the world. And, you know, the more I think we can face that and achieve transparency, um, both culturally and individually, you know, that's the, dia the principle of diaphaneity. Uh, this is the integral world that we are more, that we can co-inhabit multiple modes of being as our ancestors did. Uh, so there's, there's, again, you know, some may say that's the kind of the Wilberian pre-trans fallacy. And I have deep, deep critiques of Wilber's linear developmentalism on the one hand, um, which I know he doesn't always fall into, but when it comes to the pre-trans fallacy, I think he certainly does. Um, our ancestors in, in Gepser's model, the archaic and the magic and the mythic, each of them have a mode of mature expression, uh, an ontology of the world that is co-valid with the mental, the later mental perspectival scientific world, co-valid, not simply part of the stage of maturity, but a co-valid ontological reality. So in, the only way to accommodate that is to have a much more rhizomatic map that both accounts for the emergence, uh, unfolding of consciousness, and the plurality, right? And so that's part of what I'm saying with my book is that we need a much more um, uh, aperspectival expression of the history of consciousness. I'm going off now. Let me move on to uh, more comments. Uh, what doesn't fall, we build from. You know, another thing about that, Steve, uh, is this has this come up a lot in conversations, actually. Um, seeing this century and this time period in terms of what we've gone through this year very acutely uh, as, as the composting for the future, for regenerative futures, for planetary cultures, um, Collapse is a part of recreation and regeneration. We could have a more enlightened collapse in that we consciously, as sometimes our ancestors did when a state was failing, we walked away. We walked away from that project, maybe taking some lessons with us. Um, we could walk away uh, because it is failing us. And the, 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 the question is what what is generated from that process of collapse, right? What is the composting of capitalism and the nation state that can take place here for a 
for a planetized humanity that is both that has retrieved locality and bioregionalism on the one hand, right? The, the in place centeredness that human beings have enjoyed for the majority of our history up until the last few hundred years, uh, retrieving that and at the same time, not just going back, right? Symbiotically retrieving these organelles of consciousness as we become something emergent and complex, a planetary future. How do we? reframe what's happening today as composting for that emergence? How do we creatively metabolize the destruction and the crisis to alleviate suffering, um, create more regenerative uh, practices and, and, and a, just a stable home for, for humans and non-humans? Uh, this, this is our obligation in the present. Um, so yeah, I like to think of this as a reframing in terms of collapse and composting. Don't worry, like we don't need to oppose capitalism. Like I know leftists would say, yes, we do. Um, and and I, would even, I would even agree with their, some of their policies in their acting out of that opposing of capitalism, but it's not compatible with this planet. And I think having the climate oriented perspective, right, of climate collapse in mind as we talk about what's going on today um, it's so important because it's we're really more in a process of helping it die. And uh, in that process of death, there is new life. So what does that look like for us, right? How do we see it this way? That to me is the ultimate integral approach to all of the obstacles and roadblocks we're seeing right now uh, to more consciously and, and in a more enlightened way enacting this future. Um, okay, if we're going to refuse it, if we're going to go stubbornly into that night, you know, um, not us per se, but our civilization, well, how do we help that along? How, how do we help this transition? Um, yeah, Adrian uh, mentioned the, the, you write the name of the work, the slow agency, uh, slow urgency is mentioned in, it's in an article, um, I'm going to post it in the chat if I still have it open by a bio Akamalafe. And I'll post it right here. Here you go. I don't know if that worked. No, that did not work. Uh, da -da. There we go. Okay. Should pop up in the chat now. And I'll share that in the show notes as well. Um, it's just a short little piece uh, uh, on slow urgency. Um, Let's see, I'm going to look through some more of our comments here. Uh, Cordula is saying, love hearing you on this. Thank you, Cordula. Um, definitely part of what I wanted to bring into the discussions that we're going to be having uh, in the Integral Conference in the fall, the German Integral Conference and, and any of the, the programming you're going to be putting together this month. And uh, be on the lookout for that. I'll try to post the links as soon as they're available for some of our discussions, it should be quite good. We're having a kind of a Gibsarian reflection on our times uh, between this month and uh, in the fall for the uh, German Integral Conference. And um, let's see, there's some other great commentary here. John Dotson is, is, is uh, sharing, hey John, uh, is sharing some, he's a fellow Gebser Society uh, member, former president. Uh, Temporal, adjective, late 14th century, worldly, secular, also terrestrial, earthly, temporary, lasting only for a time. Uh, from the old French temporal, earthly, and directly from the Latin temporalis, of time denoting time, but for a time, temporally. Tempus, time, season, moment, proper time. Yeah, so there's a processual, cyclical sense of movement, you know, uh, that, and this is why I think, um, you know, the mo most underappreciated subjects that I think Gebser brings in here uh, and that has a lot of correspondence with Owen Barfield's work is uh, linguistics and etymology and how so much of, if you see the archaeology of a word, the layers of meaning in which a word meant something and that meaning changed um, uh, actually corresponds with the structures of consciousness that Gebser talks about or that Owen Barfield talks about between original and final participation and everything in between. Um, so Temps is a good example of that, 
um, because it can mean weather, it can mean season, uh, it could also mean worldly secular. This is an interesting turn there, you know. Um, earthly and of course earth and season and agriculture are all linked. So the words that we speak in their etymological roots have tell the story of the history of consciousness. And so what's important about this, and this is sort of a methodological note for integral researchers is always to, uh, while we can never do this purely, uh, be hypersensitive and attuned to um, uh, our languaging as descriptive and non, no, descriptive and sympathesi oriented or describing living processes rather than categorical and static, right? And taxonomic, uh, taxonomic. So something like this, you know, you, your theory of the history of consciousness is informed by literally the words, the utterances you speak, the subjectivity of meaning that these words in this language has. That's what you produce your theory out of, right? In this descriptive process as much as possible. Um, yes, uh, Steve is also mentioning when I was talking about um, temps and time and climate, the coal and the oil, that's a deeper layer, right? Uh, the, the, the other deep time layer, which we were already entangled in, you know, uh, fossil fuels burning now affect the future, uh, and fossil fuels burn, burning in the 1800s affect the present, and then entangled in all that are these ancient life forms, and the ancient biology that's entangled in this whole unraveling uh, climate crisis right now from millions and millions, maybe billions of years ago. Um, so it's all entangled, right? And I think the key is to develop a, a mode of thinking and education uh, that presupposes entanglement, um, presupposes, uh, this is a term that Neri Oxman uses from uh, another scholar in her, in her paper called uh, The Age of Entanglement, uh, knotty objects, like a tying a knot, that every object is, is, is kind of a knot of interrelations. Um, I, you know, how, how much would, this is not in an isolated sense, right? But like, how much would our education be so much more effective if we started from these, these foundations of thought, where thinking must be entangled, that the world itself and our perception is, is entangled in everything else, that everything is naughty, that everything is temporally interlinked, um, I don't think this is something that needs to be academically rarefied and elite. This, this is, um, I wrote about this in my metamodern essay uh, on side view. This is a structure of feeling uh, that can be poetically, artistically expressed from ages five and up, you know, like um, this is something this, I would love to see more of examples of in terms of uh, really kind of uh, uh, in, making this a foundation of any kind of educational work. <laughs> Steve's saying gifts come in crisis envelopes. Yeah, the poison is the gift, right? Let's see. Uh, James says, great talk. I see our project, our projects is deeply uh, consistent in terms of epistemic coherence, symbiosis of culture and sustainability. I'm always interested though, in the phenomenological ontologies we seem to be endorsing because they are very similar, but they appear to hold differences too. Could you provide some introductory sense of how your ontology relates to the standard options available? I'm a neutral monist and process-based uh, roughly. I would say it's, um, I, don't, I don't know about monism or not. I, I, I found those to be deeply, I know philosophers would hate this, but I've just found those to be deeply unhelpful <laughs> um, positions and abstract. I, I would say my philosophy orients around um, uh, maybe a little bit of object-oriented ontology, uh, uh, a little bit of what Weber talks about in terms of the poetics of the Anthropocene. Um, I'm informed by the process-related uh, material, but I haven't read Whitehead deeply at all. And I'm hoping to do that next year, but uh, I get most of my temporal thinking from, from Gepser. Um, and in terms of ontology, I use this much more loosely 
and not really not really situated in the classical training of uh, of schools of philosophical thought. So I'd have to get back to you on where I where I relate to neutral monism. Um, maybe I could say that I uh, what what is Deleuze? You know, I I found myself agreeing with pretty much everything that I, I read in Deleuze. But of course, that could be a very highly subjective and interpretive uh, process. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's that would be my reply to you there in terms of uh, in terms of baselines, um, imminence, Deleuzian thought, object oriented ontology, uh, as, as Sympoesis and Haraway. I think I find those to be some of my my foundations. Uh, Gepser, of course, and ontology. I'm I'm using this also in in the way Gepser talks about it, and that this is describing a um, a, 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 a time-space relationship, and he posits those in, in his book, Ever-Present Origin. Um, so I'm also speaking of ontology in that sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe we can kind of open it up from there. And yes, we should definitely talk more soon. Let's see, uh, Steve is also mentioning uh, dimensional enhancement, metamorphosis, caterpillar to butterfly. Funny you mentioned that. Um, Eric Reynolds and I, uh, we've been working on uh, the Integral Leadership Review Journal, um, and there's some really exciting projects and revamping in the works with that. Um, I've been very honored and excited to, to be um, involved in this project now and its development, but uh, that's one of the words that came up in, in the, the, the letter, the opening letter to the issue, uh, the imago or the imaginal self. Um, I think that's... That's good. Uh, I, I've been rereading Jeffrey Kripal's Mutants and Mystics with my wife in the evenings, as you do. Um, and that has been one of the topics coming up again and again, the idea of imaginal cells, um, the idea of uh, imagination as this sort of uh, creative matrix for not only cultural evolution, but life, right? Um, I guess Berkson, let's throw another guy on there. Berkson is another one, James. Um, who's been a big influence for me um, in terms of uh, his, his commentary on time and life and the Elan Vital. Uh, but yeah, metamorphosis. I mean, I think that would be the role of, like Joe Brewer is, is, is suggesting that what we do is we create um, kind of quasi-monastic learning centers that are bioregionally situated, that function as schools, libraries, practice centers, experimental spaces, educational spaces. And those in turn network and coordinate with other, other uh, bioregional centers across the planet as everyone kind of problem solves a lot of these regenerative practices uh, that are hyper-local on the one hand, and then also in praxis um, deeply planetary, right? We're talking about climate dynamics, planetary dynamics, um, et cetera. So hyper-local, profoundly planetary, quasi-learning centers, quasi-monastic centers. Um, and I think, I think of these as, as imaginal cells in a way, right? In the same way that perhaps monastic centers were the imaginal cells of, of uh, uh, the birth of humanism and uh, Western enlightenment, and modernity. Um, what, what with their, you know, innovations of clocks and clock making and clock time, and et cetera, um, accruing of, of, of ancient Hellenistic knowledge, uh, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's a metaphor and analogy there that is very useful. Um, and to, to, to the point, right, to the cosmotheandric point, the creative process, like as Gebser says, and I think we, we see this in, in the Tao as well, uh, origin is a creative process, right? To participate in origin is to participate in this creative spiritual becoming uh, of, of matter becoming in a meaningful way, meeting the other in mutuality, in transformation. And I mean, what else is that but metamorphosis, right? The caterpillar and the butterfly are a node of that transformation in this, in this sort of mutuality of life. And I think that has to be part of the this emergent um, ontology that we're discussing here. Let's see. Uh, let's keep scrolling. 
Uh, James says, it seems you are a pluralist in line with William James then. If that's true, there's a constant need to reconcile deeply conflicting notice views. It may be a, a typo there. It seems that claiming such a multiplicity of truths requires some method of deciding what parts of each position are compatible and true and how they can be held together if they apparently conflict. Yeah, I think, you know, I think some of the problems with um, uh, classical or traditional philosophy has been its kind of monological style of thinking that like some kind of transcendent logic needs to hold it all together. And I don't know, I, I would just say um, I'm a weird studies kid. I think it, logic doesn't hold it together. There's, uh, the, there's a kind of abyss of unknowing that, uh, that uh, gosh, what's his name? Eugene Thacker talks about in uh, The Horror of Philosophy that I think we really need to hold here, you know? Um, but I, I, have, I'm, I consider that a compliment being called uh, a pluralist in, the, in line with William James. I, I really do uh, love his writing. A pluralistic universe is uh, particularly, um, I, I particularly hold that one dear. So I don't know, maybe as I enter into academia and I actually have to um, construct a certain uh, theoretical frameworks, I will, I will come down on that position and defend it better for you. Uh, but I appreciate being called a William Jamesian in that sense. Let's see, uh, Cordula is posting about the conference. Uh, it'll be hosted on Parallax magazine. Cool, that's great, Cordula. To give it a wider context and debate beyond limitations of integral, yet looking forward to discuss these topics in the upcoming integral talk series of our German forum. Yeah, the, so what we're doing this, uh, what Cordula is talking about, for those who are just listening, uh, to the audio, we're uh, hosting a forum discussion with uh, uh, with Rudolf Hammerly, uh, Aaron Cheek, myself, uh, maybe a few others who are going to be talking about Gepser in the present. And um, it should be really good. It should be really, really fascinating. Uh, Cordula has a question. What does the pain feel like with crises to mutate from mental to integral, how is it showing up individually and globally? Um, and that's such a good question. I think it's also what, you know, it's the environmental surround this, like this talk has been kind of about in terms of um, all of these different manifold crises that are unraveling right now. Um, I think the, the pain that we're feeling is the sense that, um, uh, our our mode of, of thinking about the world and our solutions to the problems are not efficient enough, that we are not able to slow down significantly enough. Um, there's a deep existential anxiety here. And that goes along, I think, with the mental angst that Gebser talks about. Angst being uh, part of the, the um, existential conditions of the mental, like being hyper individuated uh, self reflective conscious being aware of their own death and in some sense fixated on their, their material uh, perpetuity uh, ends up developing a deep anxiety about that right a deep existential angst about um, the horizon of death and I think right now as a civilization we are dealing with a, a collective angst of the horizon of death um, we know it's coming up like an individual would know or would fear uh, in apprehension of. Um, the horizon of this century doesn't seem like it will allow our civilization to continue. And so there's a deep sense of uh, not knowing who we are. And I think the other aspect of that angst is uh, because of the monological fixation of the, of the perspectival world, of the mental world, um, the, the, the process of cultural evolution has been such that we've driven out meaning making, we've driven out the other structures of consciousness. Um, not, th not that we've truly become separated from them, but we've really lost our capacity to, to have them um, uh, fully expressed in a part of our being in a healthy way. Our soul, our soul making, or like I've told, said before, our, industrialization has opened up all of these opportunities. It's also shut down so many that now need to be retrieved. 
um, regenerating the land also has to mean regenerating the soul, right? The psyche, um, regenerating an indigenous, uh, the, 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 the loss of that, the indigenous cosmology and worldview and the magic and the mythic and the archaic, um, we've, we've lost, we've been lost to our past. This is, the, this is what I would get to. The pain is a true sense of the flatness of the mental. Um, we have severed the past and by the same blade, the other side of the blade um, has severed the future because there is no more future for this civilization, right? This, this on top, this structure of consciousness alone and cut off and monological as it is, it has no future and it doesn't have a past that it, that is familiar with anymore. It is lost to itself. And that I think is the deep, deep spiritual pain that um, many people feel today. And there's different languages for that. Like, um, you know, a lot of people talk about the collapse of, uh, well, atomization and alienation in, in neoliberal capitalism, and atomization of the workers that denatures us and decultures us. And uh, even Gebser talks about industrialization, removing the capacity for human beings to make with their own hands. Um, so there's a loss of insolment, there's a loss of regionalism and localism. Um, you know, we didn't transcend and include that. Those may have not been in a healthy place. Uh, you know, the developments and advancements of, of the industrial world, the perspectival world, the modernity may have been very alluring for the capacity to now self-make in a different way. Um, but doing so one-sidedly, we, we cut ourselves off from those other modes of being, right? So the deep angst and the deep pain is being lost to our own being, lost to our own deep sense of self and world, um, lost to participation and therefore lost to the future. So ironically, um, a monological perspectival time uh, um, ultimately, like ratio does, it cuts everything off and ultimately atomizes itself into a null and a nothing. And I think that is the, both subjectively and now, of course, in when we're talking about the existential planetary crisis, um, materially, um, that is the spiritual dark night that we're in. That is the pain, you know. Um, I hope that answers the question well. But same token, right? The same, you, you turn that around. Um, the crisis could lead to an opening, right? Because you really give up, like, all right, I need to give up this monological, direct, directorial, perspectival fixation. That's the only way to regenerate and remediate. And because of that, you know, then the allowance and acceptance of that dying, right, to overcome the self in both the individual sense and also somehow in the social imaginary and in, in the collective sense, when we overcome that, when we surrender to that release, then I think we begin to be open to regeneration, right? Um, so I think we have to, to, to die, right? As Bruce Lee uh, says, um, Bruce Lee fan, uh, to die is to be liberated from it. So I think the mental world has to learn how to die. Um, and it, its own process of fixation has done a good job preparing that lesson, it really has. Uh, thank you, Robin. Yes, definitely looking forward to our next conversation with Eric. Okay, let's see if I can get to anybody. Oh, Cordula has a follow-up actually. Um, how can the term nocturnal, which Gebser talks about, help with that pain? Um, well, well, part of this is is in his in his diaphony, right? The principle of diaphony, um, which once we accept this, right, that the the the, the waking perspectival world, which is so fixated on um, ratio measurement waking consciousness, directed temporics, um, you know, the ego is really what comes online here and crystallizes. Um, but once we begin to overcome that, um, as challenging as that can be, um, what the integral really does, and this is why it's not linear, right? That we become open to the living past and open to the future. And so by nocturne or nocturnal, 
I think what you're really referencing is like Gebser's description of, of the unperspectival world, which he associates uh, closer, and he's not the only one who's talked about this, Leonard Schlein, Ian McGilchrist, Gary Lachman, uh, Julian Jaynes, um, the psychical components of being in the world, right? The non-modernist, um, both indigenous and, and, and pre, quote unquote pre-modern uh, worldviews, structures of consciousness that inhabit uh, a, a more psychical, imaginal way of, of being in the world with their own sense of time, their own sense of what space is, and it's a more imaginal form of space. Um, so inhabiting the night and the day, and that's the idea, it's a kind of, it's a good metaphor, and I think it's largely descriptively accurate that the magic and the mythic kind of do embody this nocturne oriented, um, symbolic, meaning oriented mode of participating in the world, right? The poetic, the poetics of participating in the world. Uh, Richard Tarnas also speaks quite a bit about that um, in the sense of, uh, and, and so does our Owen Barfield, original participation. So that is the nocturne, right? That is the, that's part of who we are. That doesn't go away. It's not something that needs to developmentally mature. In fact, there's many, many ways that we need to retrieve the excellence and maturation of the unperspectival world, which has its own wisdom, right? The wisdom of the dark, the wisdom of the nocturne and of the dream, uh, something Jung talked about quite a bit. So I think that is what it means to bring the nocturne forward in this process of remediation. And so what Gebser talks about as a kind of a personal praxis we can do is um, as part of this healing process, we attempt to uh, kind of fl uh, flow uh, between the magic and the mythic, the unperspectival structures concretely, right? Working with the dream life, working with the deep interior uh, psychistic life of, of, uh, of meaning making, different temporic, cyclical time, uh, becoming present, uh, working with ancestors, um, you know, th that kind of deep indigene indigeneity of the human being is what needs to be remediated in a profound sense. And that's so much of what actually regenerative culture is, right? So I, when, you, when you're talking about this, um, the nocturne with Gebser and helping this pain, well, think about the, the, the ratio human being that is deeply materialized, lost to the deep past, lost to the future. Part of what, uh, re that remediation process is becoming whole again and realizing wholeness again. And that means bringing forward the nocturne. We don't need to bring forward the, the daylight. You know, we, we, we've done that. That's the whole idea in actually um, seeing reversals in an integral sense in that we've overextended the, the waking daylight um, consciousness and what really needs to be integrated now is the is the nocturne uh, and at the same time we can't just see this as a reversal in a totalizing sense that's too perspectival in thought right that we're too contaminated with perspectival thinking diaphaneity is the personal and also methodological orientation Gebser offers which is have a deep sense of equanimity as you work to remediate these capacities in yourself. So what happens is um, as you begin to practice the, with these different modes of consciousness, uh, the dynamic creative energy of moving between them uh, allows the emergence of this transparency. It presentiates itself through these different ontologies, through these different ways of being in the world, right? working with ancestors and yet also um, really kind of coming online with a sense of the knottedness and inter in the entanglement of time past present and future in this praxis begin to cohere and that can't be forced but the praxis that Gebser implied in his writing um, can help it presentiate itself and come forward and it's really that presentiation rather than just remediating the nocturne alone. 
that allows that wholeness to come into being, right? And that has some, that is a spiritual process that Gebser says it happens of itself that we can participate in and with. And I think that's sort of the the crux of what he talks about. And it's also what I'm going to be um, hopefully talking about with uh, with uh, my my next course in the fall, which will be kind of praxis oriented. Uh, let's see, he calls out the feminine process. Could that be regarded to integrating female wisdom after the mental phase again? in an integrated sense, yes, yes. Um, by being conscious more in the irrational, the complex, the nonlinear, the receptive, the multidimensional. This is in fact a healing of patriarchal and pre-modern matriarchal stages. Yes, yes to all of that. <laughs> um, the, I mean, uh, like, you know, the, my interpretation as well, but Gebser says it right in Ever Present Origin, the supersession of patriarchy is one of the characteristics of the integral turn. He has a beautiful passage about um, Mary and uh, the, the, the dogmatizing, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but the uh, bringing in of Mary as a, uh, in, in a kind of a theological station in the Catholic Church uh, equal to that of Christ, this is the mother of God, assumed into heaven, right? This is all theology. But the idea of integrating the feminine is tremendous part of this and again like this is why i defend the left quote unquote this is why i defend um attempts to integrate what has been repressed and rejected because that is part of the process of becoming whole and that's exactly what you're talking about and as you're saying um becoming more conscious of the irrational the complex the nonlinear, the receptive the multi-dimensional um the this is what Le Guin calls utopia utopia yin rather than utopia yang uh, she kind of says we, we don't need any more apollonic waking scientifically euclideanly spatial utopias that kind of map out the future we need reversals we need darkness uh we need um we need a utopia yin to balance out this utopia yang so I think this is certainly part of the integrative process. Um, and yes, I do think there's a, there's a synergy or a resonance between uh, the irrational, the nonlinear and complex adaptive systems and complex uh, dynamic systems that we're talking about. Um, I would say though, to, to make this distinction the same way Gepser does, that um, they are the path into the irrational. Um, and complex systems thinking, planetary thinking, uh, integral temporics is not limited to the irrational or the nocturne, right? It is, it is uh, um, uh, an invisible clarity, right? A, a seeing through, not an illumination of waking lights, but a, a clarification. And that, that, that is sort of an equanimous, diaphanous intensity that sees through the night and the day. And the only way to achieve that, though, is to see the masculine and the feminine, the, 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 the waking and the dreaming, um, however we want to uh, uh, associate those, those terms. So, yes, yeah, so I'm just rambling now, but I think reintegration, remediation of the feminine and the nocturne is part of what it means to become whole. And the fact that it is showing up right now is an indication of the aperspectival world, right? is an indication of that pressing forward to become integrated and realized in, in, in our culture, in our social imaginary, in, in our subjectivities. So all of that, yes to all of that. Um, any other questions? Um, Adrian saying, regenerate the soul, the psyche. Yeah, regenerative practices is, it's, it's, a, it's a psychical process, it's a soul process, it's an earth process, it's a systems process. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I'll have to get back to, to James's question about ar arguing for pragmatism and synthesizing. I don't even know if synthesizing is necessarily helpful either. Um, let's see. 
I'll have to revisit that. Uh, especially in terms of methodology. But yeah, thank you all. Um, if there's no other questions, I just want to quickly give a quick summary. You can pick up my first book in the show notes, uh, Seeing Through the World. Um, and I'm currently working on Fragments of an Integral Futurism, which has been sort of the subject of this chat today. Thank you for helping me kind of think through some aspects of it. Um, and Ever Present Origin is now available on the Kindle. So <laughs> go ahead and check that out. I'm just so excited about that. I can't understate. I didn't think I'd see the day, but it is now available on Kindle. Um, feel free to join my Patreon community, which uh, I host bi-weekly Zoom calls, or sometimes weekly. Uh, we're going to do a, a pop-up integral study session, which is more of a cohort, cohort uh, discussion group on Zoom. And subscribe to the podcast, connect with me on Twitter, um, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I will see you online. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime, by the way, if you have some more comments. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>